how's everybody doing this afternoon? It's so great to see this room just packed. So it is my honor to welcome all of you to Plymouth Housing's Key to Hope Luncheon. I'm Joyce Taylor from King 5 Television, and I think this might even be my 20th year. So, wow. I love Plymouth Housing so much. And this luncheon, by the way, is the 20th anniversary of Key to Hope. So we have to give it up. Some of you have been coming for all 20 years. So happy anniversary to Key to Hope. Uh, like so many of you in this room, for years we have watched Plymouth do incredible work all across the community to help so many of our neighbors who have been experiencing homelessness. You're going to meet one of those people today who is now a manager at one of Plymouth's um, housing operations. And so Michelle's gonna be on the stage in just a little bit. We have an incredible keynote also coming up. So we have a lot to get to. But for now, I want to bring to the stage Plymouth Housing's incoming president of the Board of Trustees. Will you please welcome Ben Strawn? Thank you, Joyce. I'm Ben Strawn, and I'm truly grateful to be in a room with so many passionate supporters of Plymouth Housing. Thank you for joining us today. You know, at this event in the past, I'm usually sitting where you are, and I admit, right now I'd be thinking, Joyce has left the stage, someone I don't really know is talking, and I'm going to eat some lunch. <laughs> I'm on your side. Please, eat your lunch, but also listen as we express our appreciation for a few groups of individuals who helped make today's event a reality. I also want to share one reason I support Plymouth. You may well know that Plymouth has a 40-year track record of success in providing permanent supportive housing for the most vulnerable members of our community. That speaks to the consistency and commitment of the organization. But consistency and commitment are not enough. Plymouth must also navigate the constantly shifting hurdles in our region from needs for behavioral health and substance use recovery services to skyrocketing living costs. All of these make housing the unhoused an ever unfolding challenge. The Plymouth team is up to meeting that challenge and that's why I support Plymouth. That's also why we need your help today more than ever. In addition to all of you, this luncheon would not happen without a tremendous amount of work from dozens of volunteers, and especially the members of the luncheon committee, led by co-chair Lavina Sidwani, a fellow board member, and Tom Pozariki. Committee members, please stand and be recognized. Thank you. I'd also like to recognize Plymouth's Board of Trustees. Stepping into the role of President of the Board is a privilege. It's a privilege to work with the trustees who are a diverse and dedicated group of volunteers from throughout our region with a singular dedication to Plymouth's mission of permanent supportive housing and providing for its residents and its team. It's also a responsibility as I'm following Lainey Sickinger, our current board chair. Lainey could not be here today, but her energy and leadership in supporting the organization have been exemplary. And I'm grateful, as we all are, for all that she brings. Will the members of the Board of Trustees please stand? Thank you very much for your leadership. There are two more groups of Plymouth supporters who merit particular thanks. The first is the Luncheon Challenge Fund supporters. These supporters, whose names are or will be listed on the screens around the room, have collectively donated over $600,000 to inspire all of you to stretch your gift to Plymouth today. So when you get the donation envelopes later in the program, 
please give as much as you can and help Plymouth continue its good work. And finally, I'd like to thank our dedicated table captains in the room. Thank you for your support and your persistence because tables don't fill themselves. Because of you, this room is packed with a community of passionate individuals who answered your call and were here today to learn more about Plymouth and its mission. Let's have a round of applause for these incredible groups of Plymouth supporters. Now please get your last few bites in and help me welcome Joyce Taylor back to the stage. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate that. We are going to take a few minutes so that you can enjoy your table mates and you can eat, enjoy your lunch, but I do want to recognize the sponsors because without the corporate sponsors, this lunch would just simply not be possible. So first, we want to say thank you to Platinum Sponsors for stepping up to the plate this year. You can see them on the screens. They are Avalon Bay Communities, Delta Dental of Washington, Goodman Real Estate, Pagliacci, Urban Renaissance Group, Wafed Bank and Washington Holdings. And our title sponsors are Amazon, uh, JP Morgan Chase, and also Turner Construction. Thanks to you. And then finally, we want to say thanks to our most generous sponsor today. The presenting sponsor is Starbucks. Thanks to Starbucks. And then, of course, a huge thanks to all of the wonderful luncheon sponsors. You have seen their names. They've been on the screens all around you uh, before the program began. So thanks to every single person who had their fingerprints on this lunch today uh, because we couldn't have done it without you, especially your big sponsorships. We are going to get back to the program, but I do want to take a moment to recognize all of the elected officials who are here, and I am going to ask you if you could please hold your applause until everyone is standing, and then we can have one big applause at the very end. So first, Washington State Representative El Emily Alvarado is here. Washington State Representative Davina Durr. Also Washington State Representative Mi Lin Tai. Please stand. Public Lands Commissioner of Washington State, Hillary France. And please hold your applause until everyone is standing. Thank you. Uh, Bellevue Mayor Lynn Robinson, King County Council Member Claudia Balducci, Seattle City Council Member Andrew Lewis, Kenmore City Council Member David Butler, Baker, David Baker, excuse me, Kenmore City Council Member Karina File. And if there are any other elected officials here, or distinguished people here who I did not name. If you could all please stand and one big round of applause. <laughs> I know there are a few. Thank you. <laughs> all righty, now will you please welcome to the stage Plymouth Housing CEO Karen Lee. Thank you, Ms. Joyce. We appreciate so much that you have been doing this for 20 years. Um, we just appreciate you. Hello, friends. My name is Karen Lee, and I'm the CEO of Plymouth Housing. Thank you for joining us today for the 20th anniversary of our Key to Hope Luncheon. Not only is this a signature fundraising event where we invite you, members of our community, to join us, but it's a celebration of our mission and the people who make our work possible. So, Joyce already introduced the elected officials, but now we want to introduce the folks that do the real work. So, 
I would like to start with our government partners because they really do make our work possible. And not just for us at Plymouth, but for all of our partners in the housing service continuum. So, to my front, I would like to welcome Simon Foster from the King County Office of Housing, Homelessness, and Community Development. Simon, can you rise along with all of the staff members that you have that are here today? From the city of Seattle, we have Michael Winkler Chin and the Seattle Office of Housing. She's the director that we appreciate so much. Michael, can you rise along with your staff members so that we can recognize you? There you are. Thank you. Now, last but very, very not least, I'd like to thank every single member of the Plymouth housing team that is here in the room today. Can you please stand? You know, to the Plymouth staff, I am so grateful for the heart, dedication, and passion that you bring to work every day. You are seen and you are appreciated. So thank you, thank you, thank you. We'll clap, let's clap again for Plymouth staff. So, 43 years ago, members of downtown Seattle's Plymouth Church were deeply concerned when they realized that people were sleeping on their church doorstep. Plymouth Church's senior minister, Reverend David Colwell, challenged his congregation to come up with a solution proclaiming that one homeless person is one too many. His challenge gave birth to Plymouth Housing. And here we are, still fighting the good fight today, four decades later. We are committed to the same goal and the same idea. One sheltered person is one too many. Today, Plymouth Church's senior minister is Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown. Woo! She's here with us along with several of the original members that started it all, some of whom reside at Horizon House today. So I would like to recognize Reverend Dr. Brown along with Horizon House, whose members still support Plymouth Housing and other causes in our great city 43 years later. Thank you, Horizon House. They had no idea I was going to recognize them. Thank you. So I was listening to one of Reverend Brown's sermons. And one of them is relevant for us here today. It was her sermon for World Unity Day. And she spoke about the concept of love. And love as in loving our neighbor. And at the end of the sermon, she asked the congregation members to stand up and sing the old OJ song, Love Train. Yeah. And Horizon House folks were, they got up and they sang too. Do any of y'all remember this song, Love Train? So for any of you young folks in the audience, or maybe you listened to country music when you were young, it's an R&B song, R&B, rhythm and blues. It's a black song that crossed over to the pop charts. And it was an R&B song penned during the Vietnam War. And it was written by Kenneth Gamble and Leon Huff. And the theme of the song is unity, coming together and riding the train of love. 
So let's think about the original words to this song, because I sang this song a lot as a child growing up, but I sang just the chorus part, you know, people, you know, and I didn't really know the words. And I thought, if Plymouth Church can have their members stand up and sing this song in a church, they must have, it must have words that really have great meaning. So before we, we break down the lyrics to that song, I want to take you all back to high school band, high school choir. And, you, you know, and I was in band, so, you know, the band teacher would try to get you to pay attention, but one week we had to learn a little bit about how strong songs are put together. And he, he said, so you have an introduction to a song, then you, you jump in and you have a verse. And he said, then there's a chorus. And he said, all songs follow this. Introduction, verse, chorus, verse, bridge, end. And we were like, okay, this is high school. And he said, sometimes they'll say refrain instead of chorus. We're like, okay. So the interesting thing, and that's all I know. So if you guys know music theory, I'm really sorry if I just butchered it. <laughs> so what's interesting about this song is it starts with the chorus. And, you know, it's got this catchy beat. You want to snap your hands. So here are the words to the chorus. I didn't even know the words correctly until I looked it up, preparing for this speech. It's people all over the world join hands, start a love train, and then they repeat it, love train. Join hands, start a love train. Then the verse, the first verse, song is two verses. First verse says, the next stop we make will be in England. Tell all the folks in Russia and China, tell them too. Don't you know that it's time to get on board Let's get this train to keep on riding and riding on through. Now, verse 2 moves south on the globe and east. So verse 2 says, all of you brothers over in Africa, tell all the folks in Egypt and Israel, in case they hadn't heard about the, about the love train. And then, please don't miss this train at the station, because if you miss it, I feel sorry for you. Then the song is a hook. Now, a band teacher didn't tell me about hooks, but I learned about them listening to my children's music, which they listen to rap music, has a lot of hooks. So in this song, the, the hook is sang by the probably the most popular singer in the group, a man named Eddie Levert. And his hook words are, brothers and sisters, come on. Brothers and sisters, come on ride the train, get your ticket. I see some of y'all nodding your head. You guys know this song. So reading those words made me think immediately that not all that much has changed since 1972. Today, there are 29 countries worldwide who are at war. From Somalia to Myanmar to the, UK, the Ukraine, and then last week, Israel and the Gaza Strip. It's sad, and we grieve for all the violence that's worldwide. Now, we are here today at the Key to Hope Luncheon. So we believe, we, we believe in world peace, but we also believe that no one should sleep outside. And although we may not be able to impact world peace, what we can do, what we can do is show love and peace in our city, in our county, and in our region. Okay? That's right. We can be a love train. Sisters and brothers, non-binary friends, our economic success and growth in this region has been a nightmare for the poor, impoverished, and disabled. And you are here because you 
are on our love train or you want to be in our love train. And our love train can help us all change that. As one of the largest permanent supportive housing providers in our region, at Plymouth, we can and we do, we can and we do work every day towards making Reverend Colwell's dream a reality. But today we have many challenges they didn't have in 1972 or even 1980. We have skyrocketing rent costs that are coupled with drugs like fentanyl that didn't even exist five years ago. And all of us in social services, we're racing to keep up. And at Plymouth, we have customized, customized services like healthcare, substance use, treatment, counseling. And we're also growing our portfolio. We're growing the number of, of buildings that we have here. We have 19 buildings in Seattle and Bellevue. And in 2024, we're excited to break ground on a new project in Kenmore. Now, I know that there are critics out in the public that say that all of us in social services, the critics, they say that we are not doing enough, that we're not doing it fast enough, that we're not doing it well enough. And they're not just criticizing the providers, they're, 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 criticizing, they're criticizing the mayor, city council members, they're, the president, the governor, King County Council. And my answer to that is I don't think that criticism is fair. It is, it is simply not fair. To anyone who is working in our space, we don't have the resources to do all the work that we need to do to keep everyone inside. We don't have enough housing. We simply don't have enough places for people to live. So right now, permanent supportive housing and growing permanent supportive housing, it is, it is the best shot to take an immediate action on the homelessness crisis. Consider that many people experiencing homelessness, they end up in our jails or emergency rooms. And is that cheaper? Well, let's review the costs. Permanent supportive housing at Plymouth is equivalent to several weeks in the hospital or several months in jail. In other words, it costs more. It costs more to keep people homeless in King County than it does to house them. Let's, I'll say that again. It costs more to keep people homeless in King County than it does to house them. And if we don't have permanent supportive housing, what, where do the shelters send people to? If we don't have permanent supportive housing, what do affordable housing, housing providers like Bellwether, what do they do when they have someone that needs services? So I say to the critics, and, and what you can say to the critics is that would we be better off without Plymouth or Bellwether or DESC? I think not. I think not. So in the Love Train lyrics, the countries were all sung individually. They didn't mash together all the countries and say, hey, take the train to that region. They listed the countries so that every country individually could get on the love train and then come together. So at Plymouth, one of the things we try very hard to do is to respect the individuality that comes with different cultures and identities. Because keep in mind that 55% of the homeless population of King County and the residents of Plymouth are people of color. 35% are black compared to 7% of the, of the county being black. 
So we have to, we have to pay attention to issues of, issues of diversity, ethnicity, belonging, and culture. So this month, it's Hispanic Heritage Month. Thank you. And we, this too was for this month, um, so we do our best to grow along our journey of becoming an anti-racist organization and hopefully we are not adding to the trauma that our residents have felt growing up living in, here in our country. So, Talk to a little bit about why we're effective. The last thing I want to say on the number side is that 95% of the people that come to Plymouth as residents stay stably housed for the rest of their lives. So if someone asks you why, 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 What's up with those nonprofits? Just say, how would be, we be if the, if the nonprofits weren't here? Plymouth houses 95% of folks forever, and they don't return to the streets. So those are two things that you can say. And lastly, you can say that Plymouth and all of our partners, we are doing our best to innovate our services, provide behavioral health so we, that we can help deal with some of the ravages of addiction and other challenges that happen to people once they become homeless. So, for this train to keep rolling, for this love train to keep rolling, we need all of you. We need all of you to renew the Seattle housing levy and tell somebody to re renew the Seattle housing levy. I spoke earlier about the fentanyl crisis, and we are not standing pat. We are innovating new promising practices, new case management and treatment models, and we're doing it now because we don't have time for a 10-year study. So we are innovating and entering into a study all at the same time because we know that our frontline workers and our residents, they cannot wait for 10 years, and so we're innovating as we go. So. The levy will help so much because it allows us to keep our basic services going and then we can use additional funds like what you're going to help raise today for us to be, continue to innovate and add promising practices. So thank you for that. Thank you for saying yes. Thank you, Matt Griffin, for co-chairing the levy. He's sitting right here at table 21, Matt Griffin, right? We also have another person right here, Patience Malaba. And thank you, Evelyn, for, El Evelyn, for putting up with Matt. Thank you. So before I leave, people all over Seattle, we mo I, I modified the words to love train. Do you want to hear them? OK. So people all over Seattle, join in the love train. And then the next stop we make will be Kenmore. Tell all the folks in Bellevue, Kent, Federal Way, Shoreline, and Auburn that we don't want to miss this train. And we're going to keep on riding and join it. So thank you for that. Come on. Later in the program, our keynote speaker, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, will explain that many people experiencing homelessness are survivors of childhood trauma, a disruptor which can impact brain functioning alter DNA, and impact a person the rest of their adult lives. Next up, a short film will take you deeper into our work at Plymouth, and you will get to know one of our residents, Kim, who experienced homelessness after unthinkable loss and hardship through no fault of her own. As you listen and learn to the rest of the program, I invite you to seriously join the love train and think about the residents that we serve in a different way. Don't necessarily think about them as victims, but think about our residents as people that experience childhood trauma. And then expand that, not just from our current residents, but our future residents that may still be outside and unsheltered. 
And instead of looking at that resident and thinking, what did they do to end up on the street? Maybe think, what trauma did they face? What circumstances happened to them that caused them to have to be in the condition? And when you have that feeling, then you are on the love train. Thank you very much, everyone. Why are you passionate about this work to end homelessness? I am passionate about it because it is one of the biggest problems in our region currently, and I feel like we all need to do something to make change. What about you, Tom? You know, I couldn't imagine not having a home. I work downtown Seattle at Pike and Fifth. I, I walk past people suffering, mm -hmm. and I get to walk into a nice office building, and the dichotomy of that experience where we have fellow humans that are just in need, um, I think, well, I can do something. Everybody can do a little something here. Yes. What drew you to supporting Plymouth Housing? Their compassion. Many people on the street don't even feel like they're human beings. They're invisible. And Plymouth brings them in with compassion. They meet them where they're at. They're giving them health care. They're giving them case management. And they're giving them tools to get out of homelessness forever and to have a home forever. 95% of the residents who come into Plymouth get out of homelessness permanently. 95%. 95%. Amazing. And that's just a game changer. Yes. And Plymouth is growing. This year alone, they've added 300 permanent supportive housing units, which includes the first permanent supportive housing building on the east side. It's really exciting to see what this impact will be. This is not a temporary fix. This is a permanent solution. It's just so important to understand the value in an individual and that we don't pass judgment on someone just because they happen to be struggling in that moment. Even for me, I remember a time not having a savings for first month's and last month's rent. And I was too embarrassed to tell my family, yes, I'm a professional with a master's, but I have nowhere to go. That it just made me realize it could happen to anybody. I was born and raised in Tacoma, Washington and I had some struggles through life. Starting with the death of my son. He passed away at three months old from SIDS. I never really recovered totally from that. I ended up in a really very, very abusive relationship for about six, almost seven years. And it just broke me. My mom said, he's going to kill you. And I just thought, well, this is something I can do for myself to get away. I just left with the clothes I was wearing. I mean, I would sleep on the sidewalks. The shame of being unhoused can be completely debilitating. It's one of the reasons why many people lose touch with their close family and friends. Eventually, I made my way to a shelter in Snoqualmie. I thought about Snoqualmie because I used to go up there as a teenager. I would go to the falls, and I started finding that it was really soothing to me. One day, the head of the house came to me and she goes, Kim, would you be willing to relocate? Plymouth Housing is building a building there. Do you guys want to go to the open house with us? Yeah! I immediately started doing research on Plymouth Housing. I can't even explain how excited I was. I've never really got included with anything really like that. I felt uplifted that day. I felt really uplifted. When I walked into my apartment, I was just like, wow. <laughs> oh. 
Oh, I just stood there in the middle of my apartment. And I was just like, wow. I mean, overwhelmed with joy. <laughs> this is mine. And it was beautiful. It was perfect. I felt relief. Just having a place to call home is only the first step. We provide a person that they can confide in, a person who's going to support but them. Again, you're a tenant, you're not a client. Aubrey, he's my case manager here. He set me at ease, you know. For example, when he knocks on my door, he knows my issues. When I open the door, he's standing up against the wall that way. Now I thought, wow, <laughs> that's respectful. Somehow they're compassionate to everybody's issues. Our staff and our buildings are the most important part of the work we do. I really love the fact that they have a locked entry, 24-hour security, security cameras. They also have glass doors, walls, so you're not enclosed in a room. For trauma-based people, that's very, very important. It's a process of us saying, you know, we're your partner in your journey. We're here to support you. We're here to help you grow. It's great because I started getting back to a creative side of myself. And it really felt great. It's like just getting myself completed. I wish people could see beyond the homelessness. Even though every day was very scary on the streets, I met just smart, <laughs> just incredibly talented people in every way. They could play piano, they ran companies, they were veterans, they had children and families before, and then something happened that just got them in that place. Residents like him inspire me to be able to empathize and identify that this could be any one of us. And I'm just very grateful for every single person that is supporting Plymouth Housing and glad to be a part of this wonderful team. I've never felt this positive and that I am going to grow, achieve, and sky's the limit. <laughs> you know, sky's the limit. Hi, my name is Michelle Wise Bailey. <clears throat> Plymouth Housing is an extraordinary organization that helps individuals stabilize and improve their lives. Here, residents get so much support to get their lives back on track. Plymouth supports individuals in every possible way they can. I'm not saying all these amazing things about Plymouth because I work for them. I'm saying these things as someone who used to be a resident. Thirteen years ago, I made the cross-country move to Seattle from St. Louis. I came here to start my life over. Someone told me if I wanted to have a new beginning, Seattle was a good place to start, and this was so true. When I arrived in Seattle, I experienced homelessness, and I lived in a shelter. I was put on a wait list for permanent housing, and eventually I moved into a downtown building run by Plymouth Housing. I first moved into my Plymouth apartment building, the Gatewood, in July 2011. When I moved into my new home, my reaction was, wow, this is mine. It's something I felt like I accomplished. In March 2012, I was hired to work as an on-call building assistant. In September 2012, I became a full-time building assistant. And once I became full-time at Plymouth, I moved out to a market rate apartment because I knew somebody else needed Plymouth's help and support more than I did. I wanted to pay it forward. I wanted someone else to experience the awesome opportunities Plymouth has given to me. In 2017, in August 2017, 
I became the building coordinator at Plymouth on First Hill. Today, I'm proud to be the associate residential service manager of that building. <laughs> Plymouth has helped me in so many ways. They have helped me gain my self-esteem back. They helped me grow into the person I am today. I can go on and on talking about how amazing Plymouth is, but we'll be sitting there all day. <laughs> Most of our residents have been homeless for so long, but once they move into one of Plymouth's buildings, this makes them feel part of a community that accepts them for who they are without passing any judgment. It makes them feel that they have a brand new start on life. I'm so passionate about my job. My, my staff shows so much support for our residents and each other. I love telling my residents where I came from and how I got to where I am today. I hope that my story will be inspirational to others to help them move forward. For me, the best, sorry, many of our residents don't have families, so I make sure to show them that I can support them in any way I can, whether that's hosting a potluck or helping them search for something on the computer. For me, the best part of my job comes during lease signings. This is the day when residents get to see their new home for the first time. Getting to see the expression on their face makes me cry happy tears. They have somewhere to come home to. They have their own door to close after so many years without nothing. If this is something you believe in, I would like to ask you today to support by donating to Plymouth Housing. Without financial support, we will not be able to support our unhoused neighbors with the roof over their head and supportive services they need. So please, take action to end homelessness by investing in Plymouth. Your gift will change someone's life. It certainly changed mine. To help encourage you today, I want to direct you to the slides. Thanks to the generous group of Plymouth supporters, you impact, your impact will go further. At this time, table captains, if you could please pass out your envelopes, I would appreciate it. Meanwhile, as a singer and someone whose therapy is music, it is always an honor for me to sing at Plymouth community events like the Black History Month or International Women's Month. So while you take a moment to fill out your cards and give so generously to Plymouth, there is something I would like to share with you, my love of music. I would also like to dedicate this song to all the past and present employees of Plymouth Housing. You are so beautiful to me. You are so beautiful to me. Plymouth, can't you see? You're everything we hope for. And Plymouth, you're everything we need. Plymouth, you are so beautiful to the community. Plymouth, you are so wonderful to me. You are so wonderful to me. Can't you see? Plymouth, you're everything we hope for. And Plymouth, we're everything we need. Plymouth, you are so beautiful to the community. Plymouth, you are so amazing to me. You are so amazing to me. Plymouth, can't you see? You're everything we hope for. And Plymouth, we're everything we need. You are, you are, you are so beautiful to the community. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Apparently it was a button. <laughs> Tech's not my thing. Thank you so much. Alrighty. Um, just in case you all didn't hear me, first I want to say thanks Michelle so much. You are wonderful. She is one of the many success stories for Plymouth Housing and we're so grateful that you are here today to share. And again, if you haven't done so already, fill out your cards and um, be sure to pass them to your table captains and table captains. Make sure that you hand them to a representative who's at the back doors when we all leave. Alrighty, now, here to welcome Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, who is our keynote, who's, I don't know if you saw her TED talk, but I've also had the opportunity to talk with her a little bit today. She's amazing. Uh, Andrea Tharp is here, the social impact lead for Starbucks and our presenting sponsor to introduce her. Hello, thank you Joyce. I'm honored to be with you today on behalf of Starbucks to support the extraordinary and impactful work of Plymouth Housing. Starbucks is a local company, deeply rooted and invested in our hometown of Seattle. Through our community partnerships, we aim to continue to build on our 50-year legacy of working together to strengthen and uplift our community. In listening to our store partners, customers, and community members, we know that homelessness is the most pressing challenge that's facing our beloved hometown. And we're committed to working with leaders like Plymouth Housing to drive positive change that is grounded in empathy and human connection. We're incredibly pr proud of our partnership with Plymouth Housing to bring it to life in a variety of ways, from sponsoring amazing events like Kita Hope, to hosting service projects, building welcome home baskets and food bags for residents moving into the Bertha Pitts Campbell Place. As the season changes, I'm personally thrilled to have colleagues reaching out and asking if we can once again deliver coffee and treats to Plymouth residents during the holiday season. It was a favorite day last year. We're celebrating the outstanding impact of Plymouth Housing today and all of their service to our community, but we're also excited to look ahead, knowing that there is still more to be done. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris, our keynote speaker. Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris is an award-winning physician, researcher, and public health leader who has spent her career on the front lines of some of our world's most pressing public health challenges. As California's first ever Surgeon General, she helped guide the state's COVID response, co-chairing the committee to recommend vaccine allocation and helping California achieve the lowest cumulative mortality of any large state. Dr. Burke Harris's career has been dedicated to serving vulnerable communities and combating the root causes of health disparities. Her work has been profiled in the best-selling books and her TED Talk, How Childhood Trauma Affects Health Across the Lifetime, has been viewed more than 10 million times. Her book, The Deepest Well, Healing the Long-Term Effects of Childhood Adversity was called Indispensable by the New York Times. Please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris. Thank you so much. Oh. Oh. It is such a privilege and an honor to be here today, and I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to speak with you all, but I'm gonna tell you that the best part of the day for me has already happened, which was the opportunity to actually visit the, the sites and to visit and see up close the work that Plymouth Housing does and to meet with residents and to meet with staff and all of that. It, uh, for someone who is committed to uh, the well-being of our most vulnerable, it, it really was an exceptional experience. And uh, I want to start by asking a quick question. How many folks here have, are familiar with the term adverse childhood experiences? Oh my God, I love to see that so much. <laughs> when, I, uh, when I first started uh, uh, my research and my work in this field, I, you know, I'd ask a room like this and like one hand would go up, right? Um, but uh, I came to this work uh, about uh, 15 years and many hairstyles ago uh, as a pediatrician in one of San Francisco's poorest and most underserved neighborhoods. And I was taking care of my kids 
and I was doing all the things that they train us to do. I did my residency at Stanford, thought I got some good education, right? And, uh, but when I was uh, writing the prescriptions for the asthma medications or the antibiotics or uh, doing the nutrition counseling, um, we were doing a really good job, and yet I, I felt like something was missing. I, as I was hearing story after story of what my kids were experiencing, growing up in a household where a parent was struggling with substance dependence or a mental health condition, or witnessing intimate partner violence or violence in the community, I worried that the treatments I was giving in my clinic wasn't necessarily going to have the biggest impact on the things that were most affecting my kids. And then one day, like, you know, if I was a, if I was a doctor and I was in a place where uh, a whole bunch of my patients had um, a certain type of cancer or diabetes, I would become an expert in that type of cancer or diabetes. Uh, so I started diving into the research about the thing that was most affecting the kids that I was caring for, and that was trauma. And that's how I came across the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, which is, you know, big research study, looks like most, a lot of you guys know about it. It was done by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente, and they asked about eight, uh, sorry, ten categories of adverse childhood experiences. These include physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, physical or emotional neglect, or growing up in a household where someone experienced a mental health condition, uh, intimate partner violence, parental separation or divorce, parental incarceration, or substance dependence. Now, what they found in this study was uh, absolutely groundbreaking. Uh, some of it was things that we kind of knew before, and some of it was really, um, I, I think, was a surprise to a lot of people. So the first thing is just how common these things are, right? So two-thirds of their population had experienced at least one of these adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs. And... Uh, when they, and it wasn't, this wasn't my pot, you know, my community, low, low income African American community, baby hunters point. This was Kaiser San Diego. It was 70% Caucasian, 70% college educated. But the other thing that they found, right, was that for those folks who had experienced significant adverse childhood experiences, there was a dose response relationship between at what you experienced in childhood and your outcomes in adulthood. So the more ACEs you experience in childhood, the increase your risk of mental health disorders, right? In that dose-response relationship. Increase risk of substance dependence. Again, dose-response relationship. The more ACEs, the greater your risk of substance dependence. Another study that was done here in Washington State was looking at the association between adverse childhood experiences and homelessness. And we see that same dose-response relationship. The more ACEs that you've experienced in your life, the greater the, your risk of experiencing homelessness. In fact, if you compare the, the, the percentage of those people who have zero ACEs, 1.3%. Right? Experiencing homelessness. Of those with eight or more ACEs, 30%. Right? That, I mean, you talk about an effect size, we see this profound association. Now, for a lot of people, that makes sense. Okay, okay, this is, this is something we knew before. If you have a rough childhood, we understand that you're more likely to, you know, uh, have poor mental health and substance dependence outcomes. You know, we see it all the time. The thing that was a shocker for a lot of folks was that there was also that same dose-response relationship with nine out of 10 of the leading causes of death in the United States of America. Heart disease, cancer, stroke, Alzheimer's, right? So that kind of turned it on its head a little bit because before people were thinking, oh, well, you know, it must be, they grew up in a rough household. It must be something that they're doing, right? And that's why 
they have these poor outcomes. But when you talk about Alzheimer's, right, people start to, or autoimmune disease, people start to scratch their heads a little bit. And this is where I come in. Because I'm going to tell you guys, I am a self-confessed, unabashed science nerd. So I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about the biology of adversity. And there's going to be some science in here. And there's going to be a test at the end, an essay test. No, I'm just joking. No, no, no. I'm going to talk a little bit about science. But what I'm going to do is it's a... Uh, I do a little detailed science just to let you know that, like, we know what the research is, right? But then I'll, uh, uh, I'll summarize it because the more important piece is not what the actual science is. It's how we use it. It's how we apply it, right? So it all comes down to our body's biological stress response, our fight or flight system. And it works a little something like this. Imagine... You're walking in the forest, and you see this guy, right? What happens? Immediately, your amygdala, your brain's fear response system, sounds the alarm, right? And it sends a signal to your brain, sends a signal to your adrenal glands sitting on top of your kidneys, saying, release stress hormones. So you release adrenaline and cortisol, and your heart starts to pound, your pupils dilate, your airways open up, you shunt blood to your large muscles for running and jumping, and away from that itty bitty muscle that holds your bladder closed so you may pee your pants, but no judgment, okay? So you are ready to fight this bear, but if you were to think about it, fighting a bear wouldn't seem like a good idea, would it? No, look at him. He's big. He's got teeth. He's got claws. And that's why your amygdala, your fear response, when it gets activated, it sends signals up here to the part of your brain. Uh, it's the prefrontal cortex. It's responsible for judgment, impulse control, executive functioning. And it turns it way, way down. Because if you're in a forest and there's a bear, the last thing you want is impulse control getting in the way of survival, right? And instead what it does is it turns up a part of the brain called the noradrenergic nucleus of the locus ceruleus. Or as I like to call it, the part of the brain responsible for I don't know karate, but I do know karate, right? <laughs> this is the within the brain stress response center, and it's responsible for getting us amped up. Now, the less obvious thing that happens when you activate your stress response is that it also activates your immune response, right? Because if that bear gets his claws into you, you want your immune system to be primed, to bring inflammation, to stabilize that wound so that you can live long enough to either beat that bear or get away. It's brilliant. It was evolved over millennia to save our lives from a mortal threat. And in fact, the creatures that did not evolve this system, well, they didn't live to reproduce, right? But the problem is what happens when the bear comes home every night. And this biological response is activated over and over and over and over again. And it goes from being adaptive or life-saving to maladaptive or health damaging. And this biological response is present in, in all of us, right? Kids, adults, everyone. But kids are especially sensitive to the repeated activation of our biological stress response because their brains and bodies are just developing. Right? So when you have this repeated activation of the stress response, it can actually turn into a prolonged activation, which uh, as children's brains and bodies are developing in that setting, right, that it increases the risk for these long-term health challenges. So what we see is changes in the structure and function of children's developing brains their immune system, their hormonal system. This is what we call neuroendocrine 
and even the way their DNA is read and transcribed, right? So changes in all of these things to be wired to adapt to stressful environments. And this prolonged activation of the stress response is what doctors now call the toxic stress response, right? So if you ever heard the term toxic stress, this is what we're referring to, this prolonged activation of the biological stress response. So what does it do? All right, here's the super heavy science slide, but you don't have to know any of it, uh, right? So what do we see? We see changes in uh, the, uh, the stress response system, right? Overactivation of the amygdala. And I just put this up there to pause on one thing. One of these lines in there somewhere, it says VTA and reward processing dysregulation. What's the VTA? The VTA is the ventral tegmental area, which works with the nucleus accumbens. It's the pleasure and reward center of the brain. It's the part of the brain that's activated by cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, alcohol, tobacco, all of our substances of dependence. That's where they act. And so when you have high doses of adversity, there are literally changes to the structure and function of this part of the brain that predispose to substance dependence. So when people say, right, oh, so-and-so, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're struggling, they're down on their luck, well, it's their own fault because they were using those substances, it is critical for us to understand that their risk of de becoming dependent on those substances is profoundly impacted by what they have experienced in their early life. And when you've experienced that and then you have to go and try to hold down a job, the same investigators that did the original ACE study for the CDC and Kaiser Permanente, they looked at ACEs and worker performance. And no surprise, there was a same dose response relationship between ACEs and job related problems, financial problems, absenteeism, right? But here is where the science comes in. I'm here to tell you all today that ACEs are not destiny. But real change, thank you, real change require systems that address the root causes. If you've got a problem, right, as a physician, if I'm treating a patient and I'm just treating the symptoms, that patient is never going to get better. So I got to figure out what is the root cause and how do we address the root cause to be able to really provide long-term solutions? Well, it turns out that just as our biological systems are evolved in a certain way to respond to stress, it turns out that there's a lot that we can do to impact and mitigate the effect of chronic stressors on our health and our well-being. And I'm just going to put this slide up there to say it's another science slide, just to say that we know what happens. But things like social support, high-quality nurturing caregiving, uh, mindfulness, healthy sleep, exercise, all of these things reduce stress hormones, reduce inflammation, enhance neuroplasticity, which is the ability of a brain cell to make a connection to another brain cell, right? All of these things are healing. So, so there's lots of, you know, journals and research studies and publications and all that stuff, but essentially it boils down to sleep, exercise, nutrition, mindfulness, mental health, healthy relationships, and time in nature. All of these things literally biologically counteract the toxic stress response. And it leads to better outcomes. So I'm going to show you an example of something. It's from, uh, uh, it's related to uh, interventions that happen in kids, but the same impact happens in adults. So 
You heard me say that for people who have four more aces, they have uh, they're at much greater risk of engaging, of having negative health outcomes as compared to people with zero aces. So in this uh, slide, zero aces is the lovely blue-green aquamarine color. Uh, four more aces is the orange color. And we looked at two outcomes. These are uh, mental health and behavioral outcomes, but this particular study that was done in the UK, they also had this for health outcomes as well. Uh, very similar data. And we see more ACEs, greater risk. But then, for those individuals who received all of the buffering care interventions that I'm talking about, these are their outcomes, those lighter shaded outcomes. So I just want to point out two things. First of all, let's look at the orange bars for a second. For those individuals who had four or more ACEs, but received all of the buffering care supports, their outcomes are almost the same as people with zero ACEs. That's buck wild. <laughs> right? But the other second part of it, which I love, is that for those people with zero ACEs who all got all of these uh, buffering care interventions, even they did better too. So that's, that's always nice. That, that uh, makes me feel good. But the point is that the evidence is clear. Safe, stable, and nurturing relationships and environments, wraparound services, meeting people where they're at, acknowledging, seeing them, recognizing their culture, recognizing their history, recognizing their value is not only improves health outcomes, mental health outcomes, behavioral health outcomes, but in many cases and often cases that we don't even know, it's life-saving. So as I uh, stepped into the role as California's first Surgeon General. This was a very low stress gig uh, that I had over the, <laughs> the past three years. Um, but one of the things that we did was actually to bring this literature and research into practice. And we intentionally tried to engage with communities to do something called uh, networks of care interdisciplinary groups of folks doing healthcare, education, human service professionals, community members, right? Because we know that when individuals get these multidisciplinary services and particularly partner with other organizations to do that, that we get better outcomes. I'm telling y'all, today, when I went to Plymouth, this is exactly what I saw. It was housing, right, housing with case management, mental health services, health care services, culturally responsive and celebratory care. And you saw the difference, right? I saw the difference when I met residents best practices in trauma-informed systems is, is all of this stuff that we've been talking about and hearing about today. Safe, stable, and nurturing relationships and environment. Arming people with the information to understand about what, it, rather than what's wrong with them, what happened to them. And the fact that there's a lot that we can do about it implementing trauma-sensitive and trauma-informed practices and policies, coordinating and co-locating services, right? By the way, I did these slides before I did my tour this morning, right? So these are all of the, the, the best practices and providing linguistically and culturally inclusive social supports. Now, in my role as Surgeon General, when I was making the case in California to say these are best practices and we have to do them, 
Of course, the first backlash is, well, that all sounds very well and good, Dr. Brooke Harris, but how are we going to pay for it? How can we possibly afford it? That sounds really expensive. To, for the state of California, right, our an, the annual cost of ACEs for the state of California is $112.5 billion, billion with a B dollars, okay? That's a over a trillion dollars in 10 years. And as we heard today, that the cost of housing someone is less than the cost of keeping them on the streets, right? The cost of addressing ACEs is less than the cost of not addressing ACEs. That's how we got resources to do it in California, right? And so this, when we're thinking about the investments, thinking about uh, doing this work and doing it well and doing it in a way that is evidence-based, we cannot afford not to do it. But I'm gonna say, as someone who has worked in government, government is terrible at funding innovation, right? I, I, I just admit, we're great at scaling things, we're great at, you know, but we're not so hot at figuring out how to advance care and how to move things forward on the cutting edge. And we have to. And I'm gonna tell you, you guys, we can do this. In fact, Plymouth Housing is doing it with some of the most innovative and best practices that I have seen. And the good news is, right, for all of the big challenges that we are facing today, and I don't know how y'all are feeling, but I think for, for myself, it feels like there are some big challenges that we are facing. But the good news is that we don't need to boil the ocean. We just need to play our position. Right? Someone said that to me uh, a while ago. I was, I, was, uh, I was trying to figure out, gosh, you know, we have all these big things that we're struggling with. We say, hey, you know what? You don't have to do everything. You just have to play your position. Right? And for some, the position is as a, a case manager or a resource worker. For some, it's in leadership. For some, it's part of uh, being part of the mental health team. But for most of the people in the room, playing your position means supporting this work, right? Providing the resources that are necessary so that the teams that are on the front lines can do the excellent and innovative work that we know improves outcomes. And as we talk about doing this work, as we talk about how, how we can all be part of the solution, I just want to remind everyone that we need to put our own oxygen mass on first. So when I'm talking about ACEs, right, undoubtedly I'm talking about many if not the majority of clients that Plymouth serves but I'm not just talking about them. I know that many of us in this room have our own experiences. ACE is, are, is not just uh, in certain communities and certain zip codes, right? It's all of us. And so when, when we think about it, right, recognizing that as we move forward, as we go forward to not only support this work, but be partners in the long haul it also includes doing that self-care, applying this same science for ourselves, because I don't know about y'all, but you know, right around you know, summer of 2020, I don't know how many people were feeling like, huh, it used to be that I had a glass of wine at dinner and somehow it's morphed into uh, two and a half glasses of wine at dinner, right? That's your stress response. That's the, uh, that's the cortisol working, right? So really, this is all of us. And um, as we think about the impact of the pandemic, as we think about 
all the changes that are happening in this world, as we think about all the things that we are struggling with as a community, it's clear that the time is now. There has never been a more important time to be investing in trauma-informed systems and practices, in the best practices of co-locating services, meeting people where they are, honoring their humanity, recognizing the root causes so that we can get to that transformative change that makes the difference for every person. And with that, I want to say thank you for your time and attention, and thank you for being here and supporting this work. Dr. Burke Harris, thank you so much. Did we all learn something today or what? I mean, just incredible. And if you haven't seen her TED Talk, you really should dial it up because she dives deeper into the science. It's great. Thank you so much. Um, what we did learn today is that Plymouth Housing is doing it right. And for 40 years, Plymouth has been doing it right. So is there a better investment in our community than Plymouth? I don't think so. So to all of you who work for Plymouth, who have kept it going for the past 40 years. Thank you for all that you have done. For all of you in this room who've spent your afternoon with us and who have been so generous to donate to this very important cause in our community, a heartfelt thanks so much for spending this time and for your donations today. And with that, I will say, please don't forget to pass the cards to the table captains and table captains bring them to the door. And I'll see you again next year. Thanks for coming, everybody.